Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have. Lord, to come into your presence, it truly is a privilege, it's a joy. And Father, we thank you for the honor. I thank you for the honor of, Lord, being a ministry gift that you placed in the body of Christ. And Lord, we yield ourselves to your spirit, Lord God, and, and ask you, Lord, to Lord, manifest that gift today. Lord, to touch every heart and life, to minister to each and every person that's sitting here, that's watching, that's listening. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the anointing upon us, enabling us to operate. Lord, as you will, let it not be our words, but thy words that are spoken. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, no one sees us, but they see Jesus. And Father, we thank you also for the anointing upon everyone to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save, restore, and renew our souls, minds, wills, and emotions. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, in advance for all that shall be wrought in every heart and life. In Jesus' wonderful, precious, and holy name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. We've been discussing the subject of prayer. We started talking about prayer and praise. We talked a little bit about the, the prayer of faith. We've talked also about the prayer of commitment and consecration to the will of God. Remember, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus in uh, chapter 6 and verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's all types of prayer or all manner of prayer. And we should do so uh, in the spirit. And we talked about that. Just, you know, we pray with our understanding. We pray with our spirit also. I mean, if you're a spirit-filled believer, you pray in other tongues. We talked about why we do that uh, last time. Uh, because of the fact the Bible says in Romans the 8th chapter, the spirit helpeth our infirmities. And when we don't know how to pray as we ought, for he maketh the session for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth in heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, and he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we pray God's perfect will whenever we pray in the Spirit or pray in other tongues. Amen. So that's, we, we need to do that. Amen. We build ourselves up on a most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. We charge up our spiritual batteries by praying in the Holy Spirit. And so it's important that we do so as believers. If you're not filled with the Spirit, then uh, we, you know, we may move that way today, however the Lord leads us. But uh, we may, you know, if you're not filled with the Spirit, we can give you some information about help you that will help you to understand it. And then we'd be more than happy to pray with you. It would be good for you to read it first so that you can get that in your heart. And then we can pray for you, lay hands on you, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. You'll start talking in tongues just like that. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to tarry for it. It's yours. Amen. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. But we left off last time talking about the prayer of consecration and dedication. And maybe we may mention the fact that Jesus, whenever he was praying in the garden, that... Uh, while he was praying, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood because he agonized over the prayer. And the reason he agonized over it because he was going to have to be separated from God. He'd never been separated from God before from all eternity past up to that particular point. The reason he would have to be separated from God is because we were separated from God in our sin. And so for him to become our substitute, he had to take upon himself our sin. Yeah. And so while he was in the garden, he prayed and said, if there's any way... Any other way we can do this, but nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. He put the word if in there. Now remember we talked about the word prayer of faith, which is a prayer that changes things. Mark eleven twenty four. what sort of thing you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You don't put an if in the prayer of faith because you already know what God's will is before you ever pray. See, faith begins where the will of God is known, and God's word is his will. So if God said it to you in his word and said it belongs to you, Jesus paid the price for it, there's no if, ends, or buts about it. It's done. As far as God's concerned, it's available. All you have to do is receive it. That's why the Bible says, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. Amen. The problem people have with it, with it is the fact that you have to believe you receive it when you pray, not when you see it. Yes. If you believe that you receive it when you pray, you will see it if you continue to stand on the Word. It will come to pass. It's the word. It will work. Okay. And so coupling that somewhat with what we're talking about here when it comes to casting all of our cares upon him. I realize it's God's will for you to cast your cares. Yes, it is. 
God doesn't want you to carry cares. You're not created for them. That's right. That's right. Physically, you can't carry them. Are you listening? And what I mean by that is physically, if you try to carry cares or worry, we'll put it that way, put it in terms that we, we can understand. Worry is carrying cares. If you try to worry over everything, every obstacle, every circumstance, and every situation in your life, how many found out that worry has not changed one of them? It has not fixed one of them, nor can it fix one of them. But what that worry will do, it will begin to deteriorate your body. It will steal your joy. It will claim your peace. Now what happens if you lose your peace and lose your joy? Well, then you'll lose your sleep. And when you lose your sleep, physically, it'll start to wear down, tear down your body. Because your body has to have rest to rejuvenate itself. So worry will attack your physical body, your physical well-being. And it's a proven medical fact. You take people that worry and are anxious about everything, they'll develop ulcers. Are you listening? All kinds of things, you know, things happen in their bodies as a result of it. Are you all with me? And so we're not supposed to worry. We're supposed to cast those cares over on the Lord. So in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, notice it says here, casting all. Now, I got in my Bible, I circled that little word all there because that means all. You know, some people say, well, Lord, carry half of them. I'll carry the other half. No, you're not supposed to carry any of them. Amen. It says here, casting all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. So you're supposed to cast them all on the Lord. You're not supposed to carry any of them. It doesn't matter what your circumstance or what your situation is in life. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. The cares of that or the worry of that is not your place to carry. You should not do so. God doesn't want you to do so. And if you want to consecrate yourself to the will of God, then this is one of the things you need to commit yourself to, casting your cares over on him. And stop trying to carry him yourself. Because you'll never be able to fulfill God's plan, purpose, and will for your life if you're carrying the cares of everybody else in the world. You can't carry your kids' cares. You can't even, you know, listen, your kids, you train your ki children up in the way that they should go. Then it's their decision to, to continue in it or not. Once you train them, and they reach that age, and they, you know, the, the, they get to a point where they have to stand on their own faith. You can't carry the cares of that any longer. Well, I'll tell you what, I got four of them, so I know how it is to cast those cares. Because you want to carry those cares if you see them heading in the wrong direction. Anybody ever been there? You want to do what you can to fix it, but I found out you can't fix it. Why? Because if God can't fix it, you can't fix it. You can try to encourage them, yeah. but you can't carry the cares of it. You have to cast those cares, because if you don't, I know my own father, you know, he wasn't a Christian in my life growing up. Now, I know my dad was backslidden. I know he was called to preach and never did fulfill that call. I know he got back to God on his deathbed. Thank God he's in heaven. But I know this, he worried about me a lot. Because I'd take off, you know, in the evening and, and as a young child. I mean, really a teenager, young teenager, 13 years old. I'd take off, stay out all night. Ran around with an older crowd. Worst thing in the world I could have done. And they just really manipulated me and used me. And my dad would stay up all night, worry about me. Until he heard my key come into the back door. Now, I didn't know this until after he died. But I know it helped contribute to his death. Do I feel bad about it? Sure, I feel bad about it. But I can't carry the carry of that either. Because I wasn't saved. What he should have done is whip my rear end. But, you know, my brother one time, you know, as a teenager, took off and went to a rock concert. And uh, they thought he ran away. He didn't run away. He went to a weekend music festival. And he came back home. They had the cops looking for him and stuff. Well, he was in Indiana at a, a concert. And he come back home, and they thought he ran away. And so after that, they, they stopped disciplining us. That was a mistake. They should have continued to discipline us, but they was afraid we might run away. 
And so I just go do what I wanted. And that's not a good thing. But I, you know, and my dad worried about me. And so it wasn't until after he died that my mom said, every time you left, he'd stay up till he heard your key come in the door. And you see, as soon as he heard your key slip into the lock and unlock the door, he'd sneak to bed so you wouldn't know he was up. Worrying about me. Are y'all listening? See, he shouldn't have been worried about me. One, he should have disciplined me. And two, he should have cast the cares. But parents are parents because we love our kids. But how many found out carrying your cares for them does not, does not fix the problem? It does not fix the problem. Are y'all out there? In all kinds of areas. We have to cast the cares over on the Lord. Now, let me read this to you from the Amplified Bible. Verse 7, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties. Now notice that. All your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns. Notice all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns. That's every single one of them. Have you ever worried about paying a bill? Did that worry get that bill paid? Didn't do one thing to pay that bill, did it? Were you anxious about ever something in your life? Being anxious, did that ever fix it? Overly concerned? Being overly concerned, does that fix it? You're concerned about a situation. Maybe it's somebody's relationship they've gotten into. Being concerned about it didn't fix it, did it? No, it just cost you your joy. Cost you your peace. Cost you your rest. You can't, you can't carry those cares. You're not created for them. Your human body was not created to carry cares. If it would have been like we were supposed to have been in the garden, if we were still there we are supposed to be, you wouldn't have concerns or carries anyway. That's right. Isn't that true? Yeah. Why? Because when God placed man in the garden, he gave him everything he needed. And then he came down the cool of the evening and walked and talked in fellowship with him. There's no reason to be concerned there, is it? No. Be anxious? No. Or have cares? No. no. We're supposed to cast all of them over on him. Why? Because Jesus had res has restored us in Christ back to that place yes. of relationship with God. Hallelujah. And what's even better now is the fact that now God lives on the inside of us by His Spirit so we can talk to Him and fellowship with Him yes. at any given moment, at any given time because He's living on the inside of us yes. by the Holy Spirit. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. And I don't know about you, but I found this to be true. Every time I start to get concerned about something, the Holy Spirit on the inside of me will start telling me to cast it. So you have to make a decision whether you do it, obey him, or whether you just decide to carry it. Are you all out there? You have to make the decision. Have I been perfect in it? No, not by any stretch, but I'm working on it. We all should be working on it, shouldn't we? Yeah, casting all of our cares, all of our anxieties, all our worries, all our concerns, once and for all, on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Now, why is that important, that watchfully? We understand the, the affectionate part, but what about the watchfully? Well, what do you mean? He's watching over us to protect us. He's watching over us to make sure the enemy can't destroy us. Well, it's like this. If God's watching over us, then we don't have to be concerned about staying up all night. Because he never sleeps nor slumbers. So if he's watching over us, we might as well just go to sleep. Because he's got the night watch. But you know what? He's got the day watch too. Hallelujah. Amen. See, he carries... You know, Jesus carried all of our sin, all of our sicknesses, all our disease, all those things, you know. He carried for them, those for us, so we shouldn't carry them. Well, in the same way, he's there to carry our cares. So we shouldn't carry them either. Like the one woman during World War II, you know, in Europe. 
you know, they'd have air raid sirens go off, you know, through the night. And so they'd have air, air raid shelters and everybody would run to the air raid shelter. Well, this older lady, you know, she wouldn't, she didn't show up, you know, at the shelter, you know, and for a couple of different nights, the air raid sirens went off and she didn't show up. And so some of them thought maybe she moved out and, you know, out into the country with some family members to get away from it because the bombing was on the city, not in the country so much. And, uh, or they thought maybe she got killed. They didn't know for sure. Until one day they saw her walking down the street. And they said, well, hey, we haven't seen you. You know, the, the siren's been going off, but we haven't seen you at the shelter. She said, you know, I got to reading the Bible and said it, that he carries the cares for us. And he don't sleep or slumber. And I thought, well, if he's going to carry to care about it, then I, there's no reason for me to carry it. I just go ahead and sleep through the night. Amen. Sirens go off. I just trust in him. Amen. Are you all out there? Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've got to put our faith in Him. All right, so we're going to look at this a little bit differently than what I may have taught it before because I think we need it right now. As believers, we need to understand how this relates to us and us walking and healing and things like that. Because we're not careful, we'll carry the cares of symptoms. And we'll carry the cares of diagnosis. And we can't do that. Are you listening to me? We cannot do that. For a moment, we're going to turn back here and we'll be looking at this back and forth here. But turn, if you would, to Philippians, the fourth chapter real quick. I want you to notice something. That the uh, Apostle Paul said to the church at Philippi, and it's important because it's just it's, he'd be saying the same thing to the church in Belleville today. We're going to start with verse 4 and read down. Notice it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. You notice he didn't say except for certain circumstances. He said rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. In other words, we should be rejoicing in him at all times. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. No, but he does. And I know this, he's already taken care of it. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. Now the word temptation there means test or trial. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There's no temptation, no test or trial taking you, but such as is common to man. So that means the test of trial that you're going through is the same test of trial that any other person could have or has already had gone through. Amen. There's no, you know, don't let's, let's never get puffed up with so much pride that we feel like the enemy had to put together a certain attack for us. No, there's nothing new under the sun. He uses the same thing because it's effective. Okay? Because humans have a tendency to yield to it if they're not careful. We're not supposed to yield to as believers. We're not supposed to yield to that. We're not supposed to yield to fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear motivates the devil the same way faith motivates God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must do what? Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Isn't that right? Hebrews 11, 6. So we need to... Walk by faith, live by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It says that in the book of Habakkuk. It also says that in the book of Romans chapter 1. So we're supposed to live by faith. And faith sees what God's word says and acts like it's true. All right? So when it comes to casting our cares, our concerns, our worries... We're going to look at it from the standpoint when, we walk, when we're walking in health or whatever or endeavor to believe God for healing. How many found out that the enemy tries to bring thoughts to your mind to get you to worry? He brings you reports from different ways, different places, different voices. The Bible says there's many voices in the earth today and none of them without signification. So there's lots of voices out there. But they're not all the voice of God. Some of them could be the voice of your neighbor. Some of them could be the voice of your family. Some of them's the voice of the devil. 
working or operating through whoever he can. Yeah. That's right. Who, and a lot of people don't even realize the devil's using them. Yeah. But he'll operate through them. Are you listening to me? Yeah. But then you have the voice of God. Yeah. One thing you can always check and make sure it's the voice of God because it always lines up with yes. this book, the Holy Bible. That's right. yes. God's voice always lines up with what this book says. So you can rest assured if it lines up, it's God talking to you. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that the enemy may not try to use it against you, but if he does, he's going to pervert it and try to get you to do something stupid, just like he tried to get Jesus to do when he told them, hey, jump off the pinnacle of this temple. It's okay, just jump. <laughs> Why? Because he's given his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I mean, realize that's a perversion of Scripture. Yeah. You don't find anywhere in the Bible that God says just jump off cliffs or jump off high places or jump off buildings. That's not in the Bible. So you see, even though he used the word, it's contradictory to the word. So you, that helps you to understand then that wasn't God that said it. Are you all out there? I remember I was out in Las Vegas one time for a, a, a camp meeting at a church out there. A friend of ours got a church out there. And so I had some time in the afternoon, and so I took a drive out to Hoover Dam. Now, if you've never been to Hoover Dam, it's a pretty amazing place. You know, Lake Mead is right there. It's like, Lake Mead's like 700 foot deep. You know, it's amazing. It's on the Colorado River. It's right there in the mountains. And so I'm looking at the dam, and at that particular point of the dam, it's like 600 and something feet tall. And I'm looking over the edge of it. And all of a sudden, I hear this voice say, jump. Yeah, just like that. Jump. I just backed away from it. Said, no, I resist that in the name of Jesus. I resist that. But you know, there's several people I guarantee that, that heard that same voice and did. Yeah, several people committed suicide jumping. Around. And you know, it didn't have a big fence there, which is kind of shocking, you know. Because I think we was talking to John and Alice about it. And I think said, they don't have a fence. And no, there's no fence. It's just like, there's just like a... You know, just a concrete, or when I was there, it was just a concrete, you know, uh, wall, a little wall about that high. It'd be easy to get up on. And just, but you're looking down, it's way down there, and you just wow. jump. Well, that's against, that, that, that violates the word, doesn't it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That violates the word. So I just backed away from it. So, no, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I resist that. Huh? Come on now. Yeah, many voices, but not without, none without signification. There's all significance to every voice, but they're not all the voice of God. So you have to make sure it lines up with the Word. You know? Believe me, if the voice would have said, He gives His angels charge over you, I'd have said, Devil, you're a lying dog. I know His angels got charge over me, but I'm not stupid enough to jump. Y'all out there? I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that, bless your darling hearts. But if you be honest about it, yeah, you hear the devil tell, tell you to do stupid stuff. Won't he? One thing he'll try to tell you is to doubt God. That's one of the stupidest things you could ever do. Don't doubt your God. Not by any stretch. Amen? All right, so I'm going to look into this, and, and, and let's read a little further here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So we're supposed to rejoice always. How in the Lord? Rejoice in the Lord always. In what he says, and what his word says, you can rejoice in that. Yes. Verse 5, let your, moder your moderation be known in all men. The Lord is at hand. And verse 6, be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. One translation says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Be careful for nothing. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Now notice how he qualifies the prayer and supplication. It's with thanksgiving. Yes. It's not with fear. Mm -hmm. Come on now, it's not with fear. Yes. So you pray in fear and you're not praying in faith. Amen. Yes. It's the prayer of faith that'll save the sick yes. and Amen. the Lord will raise them up. 
James chapter 5. Mm -hmm. Are you listening? Yes, yes. The prayer of faith, not a prayer of fear. Prayer of fear will not get you healed. It will not get you help. It will not get your needs met. It will not get you blessed. It will not get you delivered. A prayer of fear will keep you in bondage. It's not what he says. He qualifies this. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. So what do you mean? We pray, we thank, we use the prayer of thanksgiving to continue to thank God for what it is he's promised us in his word. Yes. We rejoice in the fact that our God is indeed what more than enough. Yes. He said, because he's for us, who can succeed against us? Hallelujah. Are you all out there? Yes. King James says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Doesn't mean there won't be people or, you know, the devil will use people. The devil's going to be against you. How many understand yeah. that? Yeah. So when you look at it in the King James, sometimes it's a little bit blind to us because, the, because it says... If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, there's a lot of things can be against us, but what it literally means is who can succeed against us? Because God's for us, who can succeed against us? Doesn't mean that they're not against us, but they can't succeed against us. And that's what makes the difference. They, you, listen, the enemy will come out against us one way, but he'll run from us in seven ways. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Why? Because he's a defeated foe. Yeah. He's been reduced to zero. He's been rendered to naught. His power has been eradicated. That's what Jesus said. Or that's what he actually did. And the Apostle Paul said it to us in Colossians, the second chapter. When he nailed every one of our transgressions to the cross. And he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He defeated the devil for us. So he rendered him to naught. He reduced him to zero. The devil has no power in our life unless we give it to him. And the way we give the power to him is by what comes out of our mouth. Are you listening? Listen, cares and concerns come to you, but if you don't start spewing them out of your mouth, they have no teeth. Because if we read a little further, now turn, if you would, back to 1 Peter again. We, we talked about this a little bit last time, but... Let's look at it again. This is so good. Casting all you care upon him for he care for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Notice, be sober, be vigilant. Mm -hmm. Stick with this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Casting your cares. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Notice he's not a roaring lion. He's as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, how can the devil see or tell if you're in a position for him to devour you. How can he tell? It's simple. It's simple. It's, it really is. It's simple. No trick questions. How can he tell? Right here. Why? Life and death. Proverbs 18. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So how can the enemy tell, tell if you're capable of being devoured? He's listening. I said, he's listening. He's listening to every word you say. You may not think he is, but he's listening. And what he hears comes out of your mouth, opens a door for him. And if he sees light through the crack, how many of you ever been walked up on a, you know, in the dark of night and you could see that the, you, maybe your door was cracked? You, how'd you know? Because you saw some light coming through that shouldn't have came through. Well, it's the same way with the enemy is. He can tell when the door's cracked. But see, the thing about the devil is, he won't knock. If I walked up to your house and your door was cracked, I would still knock on the door. Why? Because I'm a gentleman. I was taught, you just don't come barging in somebody's house. You knock on the door. Are you listening? You just don't kick the door in because it's unlatched. You still knock. Why? It's not your house. Well, see, the devil's not that way. He's not a gentleman. You crack the door, he kicks the door open. He hears the words come out of your mouth. He hears those words. It cracks the door. It unlatches the door into your life. And man, he'll kick that door wide open. And before you know it, you'll have that stuff spewing out of your mouth everywhere. And how many found out the more you talk about it, the worse it gets? Huh? Why? Because you amplify the situation or you amplify the circumstance. 
You amplify the problem by speaking what you say. Now, this is something you need to understand. Amplify, magnify are synonymous. They mean the same thing. They really do. And so what happens? You start talking about those things, those concerns, those worries in your life. Whatever it is, like I said, maybe when you're talking about sickness and disease, whatever, you got symptoms in your body. You start talking about the symptoms, you magnify the symptoms. You mag- listen, you magnify the symptoms. If you magnify something, what's it do? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. See, that's why we're supposed to magnify God. Isn't that right? James chapter 4 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. How do I submit myself to God? Submit to his word. And his word talks about praising him, worshiping him, magnifying him. Magnify God and what does God do? He gets bigger in your life. He gets bigger in your eyes. The more you magnify God, the bigger God looks to you. You resist the devil and you, what do you, you resist, you stop, you, re, you refuse to think about those things, yes, those yes. thoughts he brings to your mind that are contrary to the word. Yes. You refuse to think about those things. Yes. So what happens when you do that? You minimize him. Yes. And he's, that, that thing starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller in your eyes. What it is you talk about is what you magnify. And if you talk about God and what the Word says about your circumstance or your situation, you magnify what God says. You magnify what the Word says. And so God gets bigger. The answer gets bigger. The Bible gets bigger in your life. It gets bigger in your eyes. It gets bigger in your heart. And you refuse to think about those things that are contrary to the Word. And you cast those things down. And those things get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Y'all still with me? Yes. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you ever magnified the enemy a little more than you should have? Come on, be honest about it. And remember how big, how big that thing got? Let's bring it home where we can really understand it. Maybe you, somebody you know saw you one day and really didn't acknowledge you. And so you start thinking, well, what, are they mad at me? I wonder if they're mad at me. I don't think I did anything wrong. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, you go away and you start thinking about that. And you start mumbling out of your mouth. I wonder what I did wrong. I didn't do wrong. They didn't even, they didn't even say hi. Come on now. They didn't say a word to me. I didn't do anything wrong. So then you run into somebody else who happens to know him. Hey, how you doing? Hey, did you see brother so-and-so? Yeah. Well, I saw him today. They didn't even say hi. See, that thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Huh? Isn't that true? Why? Because you're magnifying, magnifying. And, you know, make a long story short. You come to find out, they didn't even notice you. They had a battle going on in their mind. They're thinking about that. They just, you know, they may have just been looking at something they got in the mail. It was troubling them, and they didn't even notice you. you, Whenever you walked by, they didn't even see you. And they're fighting their own battle. But yet you get this thing because you think about it, you talk about it. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you get upset about it. Well, bless God, I know I did anything wrong. It's their problem. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because that's what you magnify. But if you cast that thing down, say, Lord, I don't know if they saw me or not, but you know, there might be something going on in their life. I'm going to pray for them. I'm praying. And you, Lord, minister to brother so-and-so. Touch him by your spirit. If there's anything that you need me to pray about for them, I'm going to pray. Holy Ghost, you help me to pray. Because I know them. They're my brother. They would never just walk by me and just not acknowledge me. I know better. I know that's nothing but the devil. And just start praying for them. Then you run into them, you know, and, and they come up to you and say, man, you know what? I, I was at the store the other day, and I mean, I tell you what, the enemy was just beating my brains out over this thing. And then you sit there and say, Phew. Now I know why they didn't acknowledge me. They didn't even know I was there. 
Come on now. I'm preaching pretty good, isn't it? All right. We know this is the truth, isn't it? It's the truth. All right. So, but that's just one aspect of it. But it's one we can understand. See, the enemy, he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not a roaring lion, but he's acting like one. He's looking for someone to devour. How does he see if, he, if we're capable of being devoured? He's listening. He's listening. You know, I can be in a crowd of people, and I can, and somebody start talking doubt and unbelief, and I can hear it. Why? I guess because I've been trained that way for all these years. And I can tell. Well, listen, the devil's been doing it for thousands of years. So he hears it. And he's got people watching you. Those little imps, those little demon spirits that are watching you to see if what you're saying. He sends the tests and trials that come against you, and then he's listening to how you react and respond to it. Are you with me? Amen. All right, now. So the enemy is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, whom resist, notice that, whom resist, how? Steadfast, how? In the faith. You resist him steadfast in the faith, in what the Word of God says. You, you use the Word to resist the enemy, because you believe what God says is true. You with me? You believe everything God says is true. Hallelujah. All right. I'm out of time. Isn't that a shame? Alice took all my bounties. <laughs> all I'm just, I'm just teasing, Alice. Don't listen to the devil. <laughs> you know me, I never have enough time anyway, so it doesn't matter. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to try to read down through some of this. We're going to have to, you know, pick up here on, on well, it won't, yeah, it won't be Wednesday night. It'll be Sunday. Well, why, why not Wednesday night? Because we'll be in Cal and then where are we going to be at? In Arizona. Do what we going to do out there? We're checking out a place they want us to come to a tent revival. So we got to check that out. But you'll be in good hands. All right, now. Let's start, let's go ahead and start from the first verse and read down. There, there's so much I really want to talk about, and, but it's so important to us that we get this. We really need to get this. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he, uh, he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast. Now notice, here's the, here, here, this is the key. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, we're his house, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Confidence and hope confidence and hope okay are we confident what god's word says about us are we confident verse 7 wherefore as the holy ghost saith today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation now notice the book of hebrews he's, he goes into great detail here in these two chapters right here about this provocation Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me. I don't want you to see something. This is what you got to we If we're not careful, we, have a look, we look at this as though they were tempted. But what's happening is they were tempting God. They were provoking God. Why? Because they didn't have any confidence. Are you listening? Yeah. They didn't have any confidence. 
They didn't hold fast. They didn't hold firm to the end. They should have had more than enough confidence. Yeah. Folks, listen to me. I'm telling you, now, I, I know we're all human and we could all miss it because, you know, they were human too. But I would believe, I would hope, let me put it that way, that if we had been bound up in slavery for 400 years and God brought us out like he did the children of Israel and he brought them out with a mighty hand yes, he did. and he brought them out, he healed every one of them. Yes. The Bible says it was not one weak or feeble among them. He healed every one of them. You know out of two plus million people, somebody was sick. You go to any city in the world and there's sick people. You get two, you, you, listen, you get two million plus people, there's more than one sick person. Okay? And they were slaves. They had been in bondage. They had whips laid to their backs. They walked around in that mud, stepping on stubble. You ever stepped on wheat stubble? You ever run through a wheat field barefooted? You only do it once. Because that wheat stubble will tear your bare feet up. I grew up in, in the country. Small town, walk out my backyard, my back door, right into a field. And that wheat stubble, it'll tear your feet up. Sticking out of the ground about that far or so. And I mean, it's just sharp. They've been walking around. that. You know their, their feet are all tore up. Come on now. They haven't been eating good. They're sick. But God healed every single one of them. Not only that, they were slaves, so they were broke. What did God do for them? The Bible says he came, brought them out with the riches of Egypt. That means the silver and gold of Egypt was given to them. People went to, those, to the Israelites and gave them silver. They gave them gold. They gave them you know, fine apparel. They gave them whatever they wanted to get them out of Egypt because there was judgment had come upon Pharaoh. Why? Because God's just a mean judge? No, because Pharaoh hardened his heart. God sent Moses originally and said, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. What was his original command or demand? He said, let them come out three days journey to worship me. You know, all Pharaoh had to do was let him go out and worship. But he didn't do it. He hardened his heart and resisted God and resisted God. And re he provoked God to judgment. And God had to judge him because of it. And so he brought the children of Israel out. And so because of those judgments that came on them, because Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he provoked God, then they wanted the children of Israel out. Get out of here and we'll give you something to take with you. Go. And so they left. So God did that. So what did God do? He brought them out of slavery, delivered them, healed every one of them. That's a great thing. And then brought them out with riches and took them to the Red Sea shore. And then when Pharaoh's army came after them, he parted the water and they went through on dry, dry ground. Now think about that. You know, look at, think, you know, just if, you just, just if God parted a lake, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just if you was just standing there and all of a sudden God just blows his nose and, the, and it just parts this lake and dries up the bottom and you can walk through that, and see the water standing on both sides like a giant aquarium, I realize that would blow your mind. But he did the Red Sea. And brought that two plus million people through on dry ground. And then when Pharaoh's army came in, totally destroyed the most powerful army there was in the known world. Then when they needed water to drink, he brought water out of a rock. Enough water came out of a rock to satisfy the thirst of over two million people. Now think about that. They experienced that. And when God brought them to the promised land and said, go spy it out, they came back and said, it's exactly like God said. And here's the fruit thereof. 
and they had a cluster, one cluster of grapes. Now think about this, it's hard for us to imagine it, but one cluster of grapes that was so big that in Israel, they can still produce clusters of grapes like this that are so big that you take a pole and the grapes, they'd be this, like about this wide and come all the way down to the ground. And it was even better back then. That you had to put a stave through it to carry it. There's no way you could put your hands around that big cluster of grapes and carry it. They had to put a stave through it and carry it on their shoulders. And they said, it's exactly like God said. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. But yet they said, there's giants in the land. See, they provoked God. Now think about it. They provoked him through doubt and unbelief. And it was bad enough that ten spies provoked. But was the worst thing is over two million people listened to ten people. When there was two of them that went with them, Joshua and Caleb, who both outstanding citizens, warriors, who both said, we're able and if, listen, and, they said, and, and Caleb made the statement, if God delights in us, he will deliver them in our hand. Yes. Now let me ask you a question. Did God delight himself in the children of Israel? Yes. Did he? Yes. Well, you'd think if he brought them out of slavery, healed every one of them, made them all rich, Brought him to the Red Sea shore, first vacation, 400 years. Have you heard me say that before? Where did he take him? To the beach. When the enemy came after him, he parted the water hither and thither, brought them through on dry ground, and defeated their enemy. Gave them what they needed, water out of the rock. Gave them, listen, a pillar of cloud by day to keep them cool. They're in the desert, remember that? And a fire by night to keep them warm because they're in the desert. It gets cold at night. He's taking care of them, brings them right to the promised land, provides everything they need to get there. Do you think he delighted himself in them? Yes. Yes. I mean, seriously, does yes. that, is that proof positive that God had delighted himself in the children of Israel? Yes. And what did Caleb say? If the Lord delight himself in us, he will give us this land. Yes. Well, God had already proven he delighted. And Caleb knew that and said, we can go take it. Yes. But those 10 people coerced over 2 million to doubt God. To the degree that in the 14th chapter, in the first and second verses, that they didn't even sleep all night. They were so worried about it. And talked about how God let them down. Brought them out there to kill them. Would have been better if they'd have stayed in Egypt. Said, let's make us a captain and go back to Egypt. They provoke God. All right, so what's, what's Paul saying to us today? The new covenant, he's saying Christ is a son over his own house. See, we're his, we're his house. He's the head, we're the body. Whose house are we if we hold, notice, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Confidence, rejoicing. When we say we read earlier, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Always. And again I say, rejoice. What can we rejoice in? Jesus paid the price to make everything available to us. Jesus paid the price to deal with sin and the effects of sin. Sin is what separated us from God. The effects of sin is sickness and disease and poverty and lack. So not only did he deal with the sin that separated us and brought us back into fellowship with God, but he he dealt with all the effects that sin brought in. Sickness and disease and poverty and lack. He dealt with all those things by carrying all those things on his own body. He took them upon himself. So we ought to be able to rejoice over that. Isn't that true? Yes. See, when the Bible tells us, and we'll look at it next time, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that these things are examples to us. 
of things both to do and not to do. They're examples for us. So let's, so let's think about it as we close about our own lives. If we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and God changed us, and if you have accepted Jesus, you are changed. Yes. Why? If any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creature. That's man or woman. A new creation, the Amplified Bible says, altogether. The old moral spiritual condition is gone and a new one's come. So if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creature. All things have passed away, the King James says. All things have become new. So the old moral spiritual conditions change. Now our physical body is still the same. We still look the same. He didn't turn us into movie stars. We're still the same. Huh? I mean, if you're handsome like I am, then you're still handsome. <laughs> No, if you're bald-headed, you're still bald-headed. If you're blue-eyed, you're still blue-eyed. You understand what I'm saying? No, we're still the same. But in our heart, we're different. We're changed. We're new creatures. That hate that we may have had before, because I had it before I got saved. I hated people. And before I got saved, when I got saved, I loved people. Immediately, instantly. April 22nd, 1983, 9 o'clock at night, I went from hate to love in a second. I stood there in a group of 3,000 people and loved everyone there and didn't know any of them but my wife. And she wasn't even my wife at that time. She was two weeks later. But I loved everybody there, didn't know one of them, except for the few people that brought us. There was three of them brought us. But I loved everybody instantly. Why? Because that old nature changed. Your old moral spiritual condition is gone. A new one came. I'm a new creature. So we accept that Jesus. We're born again. We're new creatures. Then you trust him to fill you with the Spirit. And he fill you with the Holy Ghost. You speak in other tongues. That's a big deal right there. Supernatural. Has he ever healed your body? Do you ever do anything for you? Do you ever answer one of your prayers? Now let me ask you a question. If God saved you, Delivered you, filled you, healed you, answered a prayer. And if the Bible says, Behold, I'm the Lord and I change not. Are you listening? If the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it does, doesn't it? If the Bible says with him there's no variables in the shadow of turning, means he never changes. Zero tolerance. What I mean by tolerance is zero change. Okay? I mean, he's, it's exactly the same. Yep. It'd be like if you put a micrometer on something and it said 10,000. And 10,000 years later, you put the same micrometer on it and it's still going to say 10,000. It doesn't change. Because yeah. God doesn't change. Okay, so he saved you, filled you, delivered you, healed you, answered your prayer. Then should you ever, ever in your life, have a reason to doubt God? He did this, 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 and he never changes. then should you doubt God? What happens if he's done this, 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 and we do doubt God? Then we're no different than the children of Israel, and we're provoking him. Because what did he do? He brought them out of slavery. He healed every one of them. He made them rich. He brought them through the Red Sea. He defeated their enemies. He gave them whatever they needed. He protected them. And he gave them a promise. And they started doubting at the promise because there was obstacles in the way. Does an obstacle change God? Let me ask you a question. 
did God fall off the throne just because the doctor said something to you? Did God change just because they gave you a pink slip when you got your check Friday? He didn't. Now, I know when you're facing adversity, the enemy is right there to to come against you and attack you whatever way he can to get you to doubt God. That's what he wants. But let me ask you, did you, did God give you the job in the first place? Yes. If God gave you the job in the first place, and the fact that you got a pink slip means that for some reason He allowed them to do that, and He had never allowed if He didn't have another plan. If He didn't have another place to take you, another job to put you in, you'd have never got the pink slip in the first place. Why? But my God yes. shall supply all of my need. Amen. And we always focus it specifically on dollars and cents. But I realize the job produces the dollar and cents, so the job's the need. Will he supply your need? And if a job's a need, will he supply a job? Will he, listen, just because there's adversity, see, God could tell you to do something. He could tell you to, to, I want you to stop doing this, I want you to do this. And if you think that you just doing that, that everything instantly is just going to be perfect for you, (laughs) and that money is just going to just start falling on you like ripe cherries off of trees, And there's not going to be any kind of adversity. There's not going to be any test or trial to try to get you to change God's plan and go your own way. I'm here to tell you that, yeah, the devil's going to make sure. He's, all hell's going to break loose. Yeah, it's going to happen. All hell's going to break loose. There's going to be adversity. There's going to be tests. There's going to be trials to try to get you to doubt. Why? Turn one, 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 one more scripture and I'm going to let you go. I promise. One more scripture. James chapter 1. Now, if you've been around me any length of time, you've heard this scripture many times. Because it's so true. James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, what does it say? Count it all joy. When? When you fall in the temptations, trials, and tests. Why? Because the trying or the proving of your faith works patience. Hebrews chapter 10 says, For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might inherit the promise. You know how many people, you know, God will speak to someone about leaving a job and starting their own business. And so they leave the job to start their business, and then the devil comes against you. So yeah, I, I went from making this money, I got this steady paycheck, and I mean, you know, I'm doing great, you know, and then all the, God says, all right, I want you to quit your job, start a business. You think the devil's just going to roll over and let you just go out there and start a business making, you know, a couple hundred grand a year? I can tell you from experience, when the Lord said to me, January 1988, I want you to go to full time in the ministry. Now, he told me to quit my job back in the summer, but then he said, I want you to go full time in the ministry, January 1988. And so, no, no, don't work secular employment. Don't go out there and work a secular job. Don't mean, don't mean by that. You'll get to, you're nine to five. You know what I'm talking about? No. And I went from my Jan, Jan and I, my wife and I, we went from making 50 grand a year. And so we're talking 30 years ago. That was pretty good money, 50 grand a year, 30 years ago. Till our yearly income 
50 grand to $1,480 for a year. Now you see that there's a big difference in there. 50,000, 1,480. Hello. I watched him drive away with our gas meter in the back of the truck. Are you listening? I had the landlord knock on the door, good Baptist man he was. And told me how no, I can't tell you what he called me. And I looked him right in the face and said, listen, I said, I don't have the money right now, but I will have it. I wasn't lying. I didn't, I wasn't going to say, oh, I got it. I got it. I, me trying to tell him I was believing God was not going to work for him. He had no faith whatsoever. No. No. I told him, you will get paid. Rest assured, you'll get paid. Every one of our bills got paid. Are you listening? God told us to do a tent revival in Tulsa. We had enough money to rent a generator. It's a hundred and something dollars for a week. Put gas in it. Somebody gave us their tent, trailer, platform, and chairs. We used our home stereo for a PA system. We put the tent up, and Channel 6 News came by. And that was back when some of the ministers had fallen. It was a big deal back then. It was all over the news. So they saw the tent, and here they came. They came in and interviewed us. They asked me, they said, where does the money come from? Because that was one of the big deals. They fell over money. Where does the money come from for this? I said, God's providing. I said, we don't have any ourselves. I said, God supplies the need. They put us on the news. They gave us, they, they ran that, our, our interview and everything, showed the meeting and everything, ran it for, it was almost five minutes of the nightly news, three different times. See, that's when we're talking about $1,480 for a whole year's income. But God said he'd supply the need. He's the one that gave us the tent, trailer, chairs, and platform. Told us to go do it. We was at camp meeting a week after that. We had, we had led 100, I believe it was, 100 and, it was 137, 173 people to the Lord in that meeting. One week. I was preaching one night, and a knife came through the side curtain of the tent, cut the, knife, cut the side curtain all the way from the top to the bottom. We just kept preaching. We was at camp meeting that next week there in Tulsa, and people saw us on the news and just walked up and started handing us money. See, God supplies the need. Are you listening? We want to pay the rent. Remember the good Baptist man? Mm. Called me every kind of no good for nothing you could be. Yeah. Handed his wife, who was, they, managed, they, was, they managed properties for a company, there was 67 rental properties they, had, they managed. Handed her the money, she stood there and started sobbing. She said, I'm so sorry for what my husband did. She said, I am so, so sorry. She said, I want you to know I, I apologize for him. And I apologize to you for not treating y'all right. She said, I watched that art, the thing they did on the news about y'all. And she said, I just sat there and wept. And thought, my God, what did we do to these people? I watched the same truck that took our gas meter away bring our gas meter back. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Huh? Yeah. We could have gave up and quit. If our eyes would have been on man and not on Jesus. See, if you think everything's just going to go good because God told you to do something, you got another thought coming. Because as soon as God told you to do it, the devil heard what God said. And he saw you start setting out to do what God said. He's going to do everything he can to stop you. He's going to get you sidetracked 
to get you over here. And it may look good, and it may sound good, and it may be like, oh, I'm going to make all this money, I'm going to do all that. And you watch how that all can turn to nothing real quick out of the will of God. But you just stick with Jesus and watch him turn everything around. I'm not telling you, listen, Brother Hagin taught us this. He said payday doesn't always come on Friday. He said payday doesn't always come twice a month. He said payday doesn't even always come all, you know, every 30 days. He said it may not even come you know, every year. He said, but I'll guarantee you this. If you stick with God, payday will come. Payday will come. Payday will come. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell you, payday will come. You just stick with him. It will come. Don't fret or have any anxiety about anything. But continuously let your requests be made on unto God with prayer and thanksgiving. Father, I thank you. I'm doing your will. You supply all of my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm not moved by what I see, hear, or feel. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what people say. I mean, my in-laws, my family, they thought we were nuts. They thought we were nuts when we got saved. They thought we were nuts when we went to Bible school. And they thought we had totally went loony when we got a tent and went preaching in the worst cities in America. But I stood there, I actually sat there as my father-in-law stood outside of our truck getting ready to leave to go do a tent revival. And my father-in-law, who thought we were crazier than crazy, years after having done it, he stood there with tears in his eyes and said, I don't want to see you go, but I know you got to obey God. Hallelujah. And I can say with great joy, my father-in-law is cheering me on from the grandstands of heaven because we didn't give up, because we didn't quit. I had the privilege of leading him to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I had the privilege of preaching his going home service. Hallelujah. And I'm going to have the privilege of hugging his neck when I get to heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he's there. It wasn't easy, but God's faithful. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, it's working mightily in every heart and every life. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Anybody need prayer for anything before we go this morning? want us to pray for you. Lay hands on you. Get up out of your seat and come down here. Let us pray for you. God loves you. We love you too. Praise God.